about identifying and overcoming spirits of prevention, hindering spirits. And I believe it's gonna bless your life. It's gonna minister to you. Listen, just believe it right now. He's in the room and he never shows up empty handed. We know that in you we live and move and have our being. Somebody say the power that works. Maybe you've never seen it before, but I have not seen nor ear heard. He has entered into the heart of man the thing God has prepared for them who love him. Hey guys, man, I'm back again. I want to talk about something today that I don't usually talk about this, you know, like we don't, we'll talk about angels, we'll talk about the demonic realm, we'll talk about, you know, how to walk in the miraculous, we're going to talk about that kind of thing, but today I want to talk about something I don't usually talk about, and that is the five reasons you're not married. I want to talk about the five reasons you're not married. Now, several years ago, I I did a video call, Why Am I Still Single? And it went viral, and a lot of people began to write to me, particularly women, because my main focus of that video was women, and I was telling them that this is why they're still single. But I want to talk today about the five reasons you're not married. And I want to start in Genesis chapter 24. So you'll see that up on the screen, Genesis 24. And it talks about Rebecca. Rebecca was the, the wife of Isaac, Abraham's son. And in Genesis 24, the servant of Abraham was sent to the daughters amongst the Canaanites and uh, was sent to the people. And he said, you know, he told them not to choose certain women from certain tribes and things like that. He gave them these instructions. But the servant said, you know what, I want to be faithful to my master. So he prayed a prayer. He said, you know what, Lord, you called my master and you sent me on this errand to find a wife for Isaac. He said, let it be that the woman who dips for me and my camels, let her be the one. And so the Bible says that he went down to the well, and here comes Rebecca. And it says three things about her that are very key when it comes to relationships. The first thing it says about her is that she was fair to look upon. She was fair to look upon. And that's the first reason many are not married, I want you to write this down, your image, your image. One of the biggest lies that we have told women in the body of Christ is that ugliness is spiritual. We've taught you that being spiritual means being ugly. And and when I say ugly, I'm not just talking about your physical features. I'm talking about a lot of people, particularly women, have an ugly demeanor. Their demeanor is ugly, meaning that they are adverse in their in their in their attire. They don't they don't present themselves. It's just not just for women, it's also for men. But the way you present yourself is indicative of what's in your heart. You gotta write that down. The way you present yourself is an indication of what's in your heart. The way you dress tells us everything we need to know about you. Well, I mean, you just you can't just judge a lady just just because I dress like that don't mean I'm like this. Can you imagine somebody walking up to somebody in a police uniform and somebody tries to steal their purse and they say, "Help, police!" Help, police, help, police. And that person says, I'm not a police officer. He said, what do you mean? So you're saying just because I'm wearing a police uniform and I'm in this police car with the blue lights on top, you think that make me a police officer? 
So here it is. People judge you based on your uniform. People judge you based on your uniform. Come on, somebody. If you don't want to be treated like a hussy, don't dress like one. Brothers, if you don't want to be treated like a hobo, don't dress like one. Come on now. So a lot of times we don't understand. But but anyway, I want to go a little deeper with this. He says she was a damsel that was fair to look upon. She was fair to look upon. Write that down. Number one, your image speaks volumes. The way you carry yourself. Your hygiene. Do you know that that smelling bad will keep you single? We don't talk about this in the church at all. We don't want to talk about it at all. We just try to pretend like it doesn't exist. Sometimes it's not incubus and succubus that's, that's keeping your man from you. Sometimes you're just musty. And so what happens is that we don't understand that our decorum and our demeanor speaks volumes. We don't talk about this in the church because classical Pentecostalism have told women don't wear makeup, don't wear, got to wear skirts down to your ankles, don't, don't do this. And so, come on somebody. The Bible says in Joel chapter 2 verse 28, it says that your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. See visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Come on, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. So now what you're doing when you wear a um come on a when you wear a potato sack to church, what you're relying upon is dreams and visions. He can't see you in the flesh, he got to see you in a dream. He got to see you in a vision. You're saying the only way you can really see who I am, you got to dream about me. Or have a vision about who I am in the spirit. And see, that kind of hyper-spirituality keeps a lot of people from getting married. I want to say this. Let's pray. Father, just give me the tongue of the learned so I don't say nothing crazy in this broadcast in the name of Jesus. And that I edify your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, great. We got that. Now listen. A lot of people hyper-spiritualize relationships and marriage. And this is why... Relationships and marriages, even in the church, end in divorce by 50%. The, the divorce rate in the church is just as high as in the world. It's 50%. Why is that? Why is the divorce rate in the world just as high? I'm sorry, in the church just as high as in the world? Because people use the same erroneous thinking that they do in the world in the church. If you want to see worldliness, Look at relationships in the church. That's one of the areas where people apply a worldly logic. We use the same logic that we used before we were born again to function within relationships in the church. And that's why those relationships have the same divorce rate. You try to hear this. So you got to understand what I'm trying to tell you. A lot of people don't understand that when you hyper-spiritualize something that is very pragmatic and practical, although marriage is a spiritual institution, it is, the institu it is the first institution of God in the earth. In fact, do you know this? Listen to this. Do you know that marriage predates the church? Before there was a church institution, there was a marital institution. God instituted marriage before he instituted the church. That says a lot. If we don't understand this, we don't really understand that. See, one comes before the other. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians, the, the, the fifth chapter, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. There is an inverse relationship. I shouldn't even say inverse relationship. I would say a correlationship or a correlation between the church and marriage. That's why we out here trying to preach to the world and get everybody saved, and our marriages are jacked up, and our homes are jacked up, and we're losing credibility because 
when you're going to get those people saved in that village in Africa, that that Jabuntu, Brother Jabuntu with a bone in his nose is saying, but how come you got a different wife this year, sir? Wasn't it? You had a you had a you had a uh a Japanese wife the last time you came. Now you got a wife come up from India. <laughs> Do you know that this actually discredits the body of Christ? The divorce in the church is 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 attacking the credibility of the body of Christ. Cuz we're we're telling people, I know enough to save your soul, but I don't enough I don't know enough to stay married. Anyway, I'm getting off my soapbox here. So we have hyper spiritualized this thing. Write this down. This is very important to understand. When you, whenever you want to attain something in the kingdom of God or in life, you have to first identify its seed. <laughs> Write that down. Before you can attain something in the kingdom of God or in life, you must first identify its seed. Now I'm going to say something very controversial. Prayer is not the seed for marriage. That's why you can pray for a husband and still be single. You can pray for a wife and still be single because prayer is not the seed for marriage. So, so the second reason, so we talked about image. I can go back to that in a minute. We talked about image, but the second reason is prayer. One of the reasons why you're still not married is because you're praying for a husband or a wife. You may say, I'm turning the channel now. That preacher done lost his mind. Ain't no way that's God. Ain't no way the Spirit of God led him to say that. Well, here's what I want you to do. Since you know so much, I want you to show me one verse in the Bible where a woman prayed for a husband. I'll wait. Please write me. You can write any correspondence to Kingdom Bridges Ministries, P.O. Box 159, Ruskin, Florida, 33575. Or go to my website, KeenanBridges.com. And I want you, once you found the scripture that refutes what I'm saying, I want you to send it to me. And then I'll talk about that scripture on my next broadcast. Go to, go to my social media pages. Write, the, write in the comment section below right now. I want you to show me the verse where Eve prayed for Adam. She couldn't pray for him. She didn't exist. Adam was first. That's why, that's why. Woman, you praying for a husband is a waste of your prayers. Eve couldn't pray for a husband because she didn't exist when Adam was created. Adam was made, he was formed first, then Eve, which means that if anybody is praying for, for the woman, it's the man. If anybody's praying for marriage, it would have been the man, not the woman. Y'all, oh, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The deer doesn't pray for the hunter. The deer doesn't say, Lord, please, please send somebody to hunt me. Send somebody to hunt me, Jesus. Hunt me, Jesus. Hunt me. No. What does the deer do? He gallops. Through the forest. He knows. He knows that there are people searching for him. The Bible says in Proverbs 31, it says, it says this. It says, a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Show me the scripture where the woman pray for a husband. And the reason God can't answer your prayer is twofold. Number one, God cannot answer a prayer that goes against his ways. Write that down. God can't answer a prayer that goes against his ways. In other words, when you pray for something that violates God's creative order or his divine order, he can't answer that prayer. You're asking amiss. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me now. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. Whoso or he that findeth a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor of the Lord. <laughs> Whoso findeth a wife. Whoso findeth a wife. So when you're praying that you will find your husband, 
you are actually out of order. God can't help you. God cannot help you disobey him. He can't help you go against his will. So anytime you're asking God to do something that's contrary to his will, he can't answer you. There is no heavenly assistance in acting upon things that are contrary to the word of God. Let me say that again. There is no heavenly assistance in acting upon things that are contrary to the word of God. That's why when you pray like that, the only help you're going to get is a familiar spirit. The only thing that's going to help you, and that spirit in you is going to help him find you, that spirit of lust. And that's why you're like, man, why? Women come to me all the time. They say, why are these men all in my inbox? Because you lusty. Why are they always talking to me? It's like I get the craziest dude. You are what you attract, baby. Oh, y'all, y'all squirming in your little seat, ain't you? I hear you squirming, honey. I see you in your little seat. You like, mm. Yeah, go on and manifest. You are what you attract. The reason I see this all the time, people say, well, man, these men are in my inbox and they're they're just, I don't understand. I keep attracting the same kind of lusty men because you're a lusty woman. Period. And this, you know why? Because you're praying in lust. You're asking a miss that you make do what? Consume it. Read James chapter four. You ask a miss, why? That you may consume it. What is the it? What you're asking for upon your own lust. You're asking a miss that you may consume it upon your own lust. It means that you are trying to get God to satisfy your lustful desires. That's number two. Number one, our image. It'll go back to the image thing. I'm not just talking about your physical features, whether you have brown eyes or whether you're, you, you have curly hair or straight hair or whether you have dimples or not or whether you're tall or whether you're a little bit big or small. I'm not talking about those things. We don't body shame here. However God made you is how God made you, and he made you fearfully and wonderfully. We know that. But I'm talking about image is the way you present yourself. Who you are and how you were made is God's gift to you. How you present yourself is your gift to us. How you how you present yourself. If you know you're big. Right. Do you know that that there's a way that, that you can come on somebody? And I know I believe in losing weight for health. But I'm talking about if you know you're a little on the bigger side, there's a way you can present yourself where you look so good. Brothers, come on, somebody. If you know, if you know you're only three feet tall, and that's just that's your lot in life. Man, but there's some there's some sneakers. Give you some Alexander McQueen's that got a little little some inches on them. Come on, man. Come on, you gotta get your prints on, get some stacks. Do something or dress in a way. If you know you're only three feet tall and you wear 100 pounds, why are you wearing baggy clothes? Now you look like an Oompa Loompa. You wearing baggy clothes? No, man, get some. Go to the go to the kids section. Get something form fitting. Come on now. Ain't nothing wrong with that. That's what I'm saying. How we present ourselves matters, church. This whole thing, it don't matter how nobody look. That's why co- folks get divorced, because they're marrying folks they're not even attracted to. You don't want to, you marry somebody you don't want to touch with a 10 foot pole? Now you're having sexual problems in your marriage? Now you're looking elsewhere? No. How you present yourself is important, friends. It's absolutely important. Secondly, understand this. Stop praying for a husband. Now, you can pray for your husband. In other words, if you're going to pray for your husband, pray, Lord, the man you have for me, I pray that you keep him. I pray that you preserve him. I pray that you develop his character. I pray that you, uh, uh, Lord, that that you keep him chaste. Now, while you're praying that God keep him chaste, you got to keep yourself chaste. Come on now. I went to my son. They went to my son and they said, they said, Israel, do you want you 
he my son is how old is Israel? Israel is um he just turned eight years old. And they and they said, Israel, do you wanna my his grandmother said, Do you wanna um do you want a little a girlfriend or something like that? You attracted? He says, What are you talking about? Like, get out of my face. Then my my his grandmother started telling him, listen, you know what? You I'm praying for your wife that she'd be really nice. And and he started thinking about it. He's like, Yeah. She's like, he's like, she's like, you excited about that? He was like, Yeah, I am. So what we gotta do is we teach our children, prepare your children for their future spouses pray for their future spouses husbands pray for your future wife wives pray for your future husbands now when i say that i'm not talking about you already a wife you pray for another husband (laughs) because people will see that's that demonic spirit it will twist what you're saying it'll twist what you're saying i'm not saying that. i'm talking about potential wives and potential husbands who will be a husband in the future, who will be a wife in the future. Pray for your future spouses. Pray for their character to be developed. Pray that they know the Lord. Pray that they have a relationship with God. And also you have to say, God, I'm willing to be the same for them. If you want a man with good credit, make sure your credit's not jacked up. Because if he has good credit and your credit's a two, when he gets with you, your, your negative two credit will negate his credit. Fellas, come on, somebody. Fellas, if you want a woman that's honorable and she's been keeping herself and I want a girl that's a virgin, make sure you sit yourself down somewhere and you're not running through the streets and philandering and all this kind of stuff and fornicating. And that way now you both can give each other something of value. So that's number two. A lot of y'all are praying for, man, I want to pray for my, show me in the scripture where a woman pray for a husband. Show me. No, because prayer is not the seed for marriage. I'll show you the seed for marriage. Go to Genesis 24 quickly. Whoso findeth the wife findeth the good thing and obtains favor of the Lord. Come on, somebody. Whoso findeth the wife findeth the good thing and obtains favor of the Lord. Am I helping anybody? Genesis chapter 24. Look at what it says. Um, and I, I stand correct. He said, I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth. Thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites. So um, I, I was said, I said earlier, and it was a mistake that Abraham told him to go down to the Canaanites. He said the opposite. Don't go to the daughters of the Canaanites. Don't go to the daughters of the Canaanites. Don't go to the daughters of the Canaanites. He says, among whom I dwell. In other words, Don't get none of these around here. Don't get none of these around here. I don't want him to have any female from around here. Now watch this. Go to my country and of my kindred. My kindred, there's so much in this. Look at what happens. Look at what it says. Verse 15, and it came to pass before he had done speaking that behold, Rebekah came out who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. She was actually a cousin. She was related. Now watch this. And the damsel, we said the first thing, was fair to look upon. She was fair to look upon. And then it says, watch this. We talked about the seed of marriage is not prayer. She was a virgin. Neither had any man known her. The reason why some of you cannot get married is because you're already married. The reason why some of you cannot get married is because you're already married. You have soul ties. You have soul ties with ex-boyfriends. Come on, ex-girlfriends, you got soul ties with people you have entered into all kind of emotional ties with. And so because you are already tethered to a man or a woman, you're not single. 
That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Likes attract. So if you're, watch this. If you are tethered to someone, you are entrenched in a relationship with someone, you're going to attract another entrenched person. Not someone who's single and ready to mingle. So what happens is that because even though you're single physically, you may not have a physical man that you that you have at home that you go home to or a physical woman that you go home to, you are tethered to people in the spirit realm. You're connected with people in the spirit. You There are strings attached to you. And do you know, watch this, that your strings speak. This is a profound revelation. Your, your strings speak. Like they vibrate. Every time you're talking, hey, my name is so-and-so. Hey, my name is Tyrone. People can sense that you're not really single. She don't seem single to me. So you're going to repel a single man. I wish I would hear this. The Bible says she was fair to look upon a virgin and no man had known her. She was not attached to anybody. Some of you, if you're going to get married, you got to get detached. You got to sever the soul ties. You got to sever the connections, sever the things, sever those things that, that, that really have nothing. You got to sever those ties. You ever see those filters on TikTok and Instagram where it's like uh, the person's there and then there's a person looking over their shoulder like this? They have these filters where it's like somebody's looking over your shoulder, but it's not real. It's inside the filter. Do you know that when you have soul ties, you have those filters? Every time you're, ladies, listen, when you have soul ties with other men, every time you're talking to a man, he senses another man looking over your shoulder. He can sense, man, she's tied to something. She ain't free. She's not free. She's not free. There's, you can tell. I, I, I smell another man somewhere. And any decent man is not going to continue to pursue you once he finds out that you already have a man in your life. Even though you say, I don't have a man in my life. The, oh, no. No. This is further exacerbated by the fact that many of you have children. If you're a single woman with children, right, there is something called a baby daddy. Not baby daddy if you don't take this thing to the courts of heaven and get a divorce decree in the spirit, that baby daddy will be a spiritual husband to you that will keep you from ever getting married. And if you get married, he will keep you from enjoying and cleaving to your husband and vice versa. These are, these are marital covenants in the spirit realm that have to be severed. And the truth of the matter is the reason why Rebecca was visible is because in the spirit realm, she was free. Y'all talking about Lord send a husband, Lord send a husband. No, you need to sever the ties so that the, God, the man that God has you can actually see you. That's number two. That's number two. Actually, that's probably number three. Because I said, number one, image. Number two, you're praying for a husband. Stop doing that. Number three, sever the ties. Sever the ties. Sever the ties. It says that no man had known her. Glory be to his holy name. No man had known her. Then it says this. It says... And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. She went down to the well. Now, that's important. That's an assignment. See, back in the day when a woman went down to the well, that was her responsibilities as a young maiden in the house, a young virgin in the house. She was the one they would have to cook and clean and run errands. She had fully embraced her assignment in that season. 
And ladies, particularly ladies. Now, I want to talk to the men, too, but I want to talk to the ladies for a second. One of the keys to being found is being fully engaged in your assignment. There is nothing more attractive than a woman in her assignment. I'm going to tell you a secret about my own life. When I met my wife, she was serving. I met her serving. We're at a Christian camp. My wife had a tray in her hand like this and was walking out of the kitchen. Just like it says in Genesis 24, Rebecca came out. Came out with a pitcher in her hand. She was in a posture of serving. She was a servant. She was a servant. She was fully engaged in her assignment of service. And you being a servant and you being in your assignment is the key to being discovered, particularly as a woman. Man, the same with you, although we're talking about women now. Adam had work before he had a wife. Write that down. Adam had work before he had a wife. And I've said this many times, and I've had people leave my church over this because I have some women married to some raggedy husbands who won't work. They're losers. They won't work. They won't get a job. The Bible says if you don't provide for your household, you are worse than an infidel. You are worse than an unfaithful man. You're worse than an unbeliever. Men, hear me. If you don't provide for your family, you are worse than an unbeliever. And we got men who want a wife but don't want to work. And then y'all have the nerve to have children. Now the children are, are, are being tormented by your broke behind. You, you know, you go to the store. Don't you touch that. Don't you look at that. You know we can't afford that. You know, And they say, why did you bring me here on this planet then? Daddy, like if you if we ain't gonna have no, we're gonna eat Rice Krispies every night. For real. Do you know how evil that is? Do you know how wicked you are to bring children in the world that you have no intention or no capacity to take care of? Now I don't believe in abortion. Don't get me wrong. Listen, I believe in having children, being fruitful and multiplying. But God gave Adam work before He gave him a wife. Some of y'all talking about, I want a wife. No, you need a job. You need a job, buddy. Get a job. And master your work. Adam mastered his work before he could manage a wife. And this is so key. Ladies, listen to me. Rebecca was in her assignment. She was doing what she was required to do in that season. And some of you are sitting here with no dreams, no goals. You don't come to church. You don't serve. You think you're going to be on Instagram looking cute, taking pictures in front of the mirror, and somebody's going to find you. No real man is going to locate you that way. The way you're going to be located is in your assignment. She was serving. She had a pitcher in her hand. She was ready to draw from the well. Are you ready to draw from the well? I know you got good filters on IG. I know you make good TikTok videos, but are you ready to draw from the well? Are you ready to draw from the well? Hear this by the Holy Ghost. Get in your assignment. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, he says, the unmarried woman cares for the things of the Lord, how she may please the Lord. Do you know it's better to be unmarried and you have the full capacity to be devoted to the Lord? This is the season where you need to be developing in your gifting, developing in your calling, developing in your assignment. Don't you wait for a husband before you find out what God's called you to do? In fact, find out what you're called to do. That way you know when he's not the one. Because once you know what you're called to do, you tell him you're called a nation. He says, I want to stay in the neighborhood. He ain't the one. You tell, you tell him, you, you, God already told you I'm going to have 80 kids and he don't want any children. He's not your husband. And see, people don't understand this. God told me what I was called to do when I was 15 years old. I knew when I was a teenager what I was called to do, and I'm doing exactly what I was called to do. I knew exactly what I was called to do when I met my wife. I, I had no questions about the fact that I was called into the ministry. She knew that, and I, didn't, I knew that. And that's how we were able to come together. So that's number four. Amen? That's number four. You need to understand that she was in her assignment. Write that down. Write that down. Number one, your image. 
Number two, your prayer life, how you're praying. Come on now. Number three, she was unknown by any man. She wasn't attached. Number four, she was in her assignment. Number five is very important. This is one of the issues right here, and I'm going to deal with, and then we're going to close out in prayer. Watch this. She filled her pitcher and came up, and the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my Lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. And she hasted, meaning she did it very fast, and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again into the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. And the man wondering at her held his peace to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold and said, whose daughter are you? Stop right there. Ladies, listen to me. She was hospitable. She was hospitable. Do you know how attractive that is? First of all, she said, the man said, can I have some water? She says, drink, my Lord. She didn't say, no. This water for my daddy. This is the Lord's water. No. Do you know that a lot of you are repelling your husband? You're repelling what God has for you because of your demeanor, because of your attitude, I hate a bad attitude, and every man I know hates it. There's nothing more unattractive. Oh, there's nothing more stank than a bad attitude. This girl said, oh, yeah, she could have said, I'm tired, I'm hot. It's hot out here. So, no, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, sir, but it's, it's, it's hot out here. No, that's all I that's all the water I got. I can't give you my water. She didn't do any of that. She said, Okay, yes, sir. In fact, let me I see your camels need to drink too, because you're on a long journey, sir. Let me go get you some water for your camels too. And she ran. Ran. Being considerate is spiritual. Being considerate. Do you know that one of the qualifications to be a leader in the body of Christ is hospitality? Read First, first Timothy. Hospitality. He, a bishop must be hospitable. Deacons must be hospitable. Hospitality is a requirement to serve in ministry. It's also a requirement to be married. There's nothing more beautiful than a considerate woman, a hospitable man. All right, listen to me. And so understand, understand that we are living in a season where God wants to bless you, but you got to know, you got to know, you got to know, you got to know, you got to know. All right, friends, listen. Before you go, we're going to talk about next week something very, very powerful. This is what I need you to do right now. Go ahead and like and share right now and subscribe to this channel. We are excited. 100,000 views. God is amazing. I need you right now to go ahead and like and subscribe and be a part of this whole community. We're building a community. We're building a tribe. And I want you to be a part of that tribe. And I want you to be a part of what God is doing in this hour. Listen, visit my website, KeenanBridges.com, and go and comment below. Also, be a part of the conversation. What are some of the topics that you want us to continue to talk about? Comment in the comment section below. Like I said, make sure you go to the website. Make sure you like and subscribe. It's going to be an amazing journey. I love you. Remember, Jesus is Lord. Bye-bye.